Well, if you're a guest with us this morning, we want to once again thank you and welcome you to uh, Arcata First Baptist. It's always great to see new faces uh, amongst us. And Lord, we do pray that uh, you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit would say to us individually and corporately. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How we relate to authority is perhaps one of the greatest indicators of our true self and our true character. For some, the topic of authority is very touchy, and just the word itself starts to trigger unhealthy thoughts and feelings within us. When we say, I, I don't like to be told what to do, or you're not the boss of me, or I'll do what I want. We are revealing a part of our character that could actually be in defiance of God himself. Now, when Paul wrote the book of Romans, which we have been studying through about, uh, I think, three months now, it's helpful uh, for us to understand its historic background, the, the setting in which the book was written. And the reason why is that the Roman government was very dictatorial and a very oppressive government, specifically towards Christians who were not the citizens of Rome. And Paul, he highlights for the Roman Christians in chapter 13 four aspects regarding the topic of the believer's relationship to authority. Because as Paul points out, in his other writings, we are first and foremost citizens of heaven, then citizens of the earth. And so because of this, uh, Romans chapter 13, it's really pregnant with both confusion and uh, controversy due to the dual citizenship all Christians have. And so as we look at Romans chapter 13 this morning, morning, it's imperative that we do so as citizens of heaven, realizing that our greatest allegiance is to the kingdom of heaven and the government of heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus uh, clearly stated, my kingdom is not of this world. And the fact that uh, as Isaiah prophesied eventually one day will come where the government shall rest upon his shoulders. But as we're going to see this morning, we are also to hold a responsibility towards the various kingdoms or governments here on earth in which we dwell. And so part of being a good citizen of heaven requires us us to be a good citizen here on earth. Let me say that again. Part of being a good citizen of heaven requires us to be good citizens here on earth. And so Paul, he builds upon the practical aspects of living out the gospel in chapter 12 as he addressed uh, topics like how we should relate to one another as believers in Christ and how we should relate really to all people in all places to now in chapter 13 in regard to how we relate to those who are in authority. Simply put, all of Romans chapter 12 prepares us for Romans chapter 13. And so I would encourage you sometime this week as you get home and perhaps you're reflecting upon this, read Romans chapter 12 first and then read Romans chapter 13 because they are very, very much inter 
interconnected and dependent upon one another. But this morning, Paul's topic in chapter 13 in large part is faith and government specifically and faith and authority generally. So faith and government specifically, faith and authority generally. And so with that, let's pick up in uh, Romans chapter 13. Uh, it's really a short chapter, only 14 verses. And we will pick up in verse uh, 1, then we will come back, we'll backtrack and begin to unpack what Paul is saying to us as individuals and as a church. Verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. They'll reap what they sow. Verse 3, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it, that is authority, is a minister of God to you and for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary, therefore what? In regard to what I just said in the first four verses, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, uh, uh, we will have a clear conscience as we obey God's word regarding this topic of authority. Verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if uh, there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to be awakened from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us when, than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to this. Now, we're going to be primarily focusing on the first five verses this morning. But I wanted to read the whole chapter because it's a short chapter and I want to, uh, us to understand it and see it in light of the context in which Paul is uh, addressing us here. And so again, he is speaking of faith and government specifically and faith and authority generally. And as he talks talks about government, and as he talks about authority, we see the very first thing that he addresses is in verse 1, and that is our relationship to government, or our relationship to 
authority. Let's read it again. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. And so Paul, he's emphasizing the government's role in the life of the believer and how we should relate to governmental authority. And he's telling us how we really can't ignore, we really can't uh, uh, non-relate to authority's role in our life. And listen, Paul is helping us to take on a godly perspective when it comes to authority and when it comes to government's role in our lives. Now, uh, if you've been here for a while, you know and you have heard me say many, many, many times, hundreds of times, that the kingdom of God, what? Flows out of relationships. And that is true. How we relate to God, how we relate to one another, how we relate to those outside the church, and then here in Romans chapter 13, how we relate to government, how we relate to authority and Paul, please hear this, Paul is wanting us to understand that how we relate to delegated authority on earth impacts how we relate to God's divine authority in heaven. In other words, they are interconnected. And he is wanting us to understand that there is a direct relationship between the two and that it is really impossible for us to separate delegated authority from divine authority because all authority exists in God and authority was created by God. And so the first thing that, that Paul hits right off the bat is our relationship to those who might be in authority over us, uh, wh whether uh, it be in the context of government or just authority in general. And he's wanting us to know that, that there is a relationship between delegated authority and divine authority. Let's not ignore it. Let's not neglect it. And let's not reject it. Now, the second thing that he addresses is in verses 1 and 2, the latter part of verse 1, and then verse 2. And that is the rule of government or the role of government. You might want to put both of those down. The role of government or authority. The rule of government or authority. <laughs> he says in the last part, of, well, let's just pick up, uh, yeah, last part of verse 1. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Verse 2, therefore, notice, whoever, that means me, that means you, that means everyone, whoever Resist authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And so here, Paul, he acknowledges both the role and the rule of worldly governments in the life of the Christian. And in the Gospels, Jesus also uh, acknowledges the role and rule of of government. Uh, he did this when he uh, told his disciples and told others, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, guys, Christian, pay your taxes, which is a very good reminder as we all enter into the tax season. It, uh, it amazes me uh, how Christian Christians try to justify and skirt around paying taxes. Now, there are legal things that we can do and can take advantage of, but what, what my concern is, is a person's heart. 
towards the government and heart towards authority and in areas like this. And so even though Jesus' primary focus was on spiritual and social issues, he did address politics at times. And that was actually the part of especially the Jews, but also some of Jesus' followers, and that is, listen, they were looking for the Messiah to be a political redeemer who would overthrow the oppressive Roman government. That is what they were looking for. And the more that people tried to push Jesus in this direction, Jesus pushed back and, and Jesus resisted and would actually withdraw for a period of time. And so let this be a word of caution to us as Christians, and it's this. Do not look for a political redeemer. Let me say that again. Let's say it out loud together. Do not look for a political redeemer. Don't do it. Because let me suggest when you have found one, you will actually be embracing the Antichrist who is going to come upon the scene and deceive the nations, uh, seducing them into thinking that he or she is this great socio-economic political redeemer that is going to save the world from all of its problems. Loved ones, there is no political redeemer. There is only one Redeemer, and His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, we see the, the, the disciples uh, struggling with this. They, they, they had this, because many of them were converted Jews, they, they had this concept of the Messiah being uh, first and foremost a, a political redeemer that would uh, overthrow uh, the oppressive governments around them. But Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Uh, let's read it out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And so Jesus uh, performed some signs and wonders and, and miracles and uh, they, they say this is the prophet, this is the, the Messiah that has come into the world and what did they want to do? They want to, wanted to make him, they wanted to force him literally to become a king on the earth. Now there was another time that we see in the Gospels where this also took place and we begin to understand how deeply rooted this thought was uh, of a political uh, redeemer during Paul's time and Jesus' time. And it happened at uh, the Mount of Transformation. Figuration in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus, uh, he, he appears with Moses and, and Elijah, and, and he is just in his transformed, glorified uh, body. He's shining in the brilliance of, of his glory. And Peter saw this. And notice what Peter said. Let's read this together. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In other words, Jesus, you're obviously king. <laughs> You've manifested yourself in your glorious, majestic brilliance. And so this is as good a place as any to establish your kingdom. And so I'm going to, if you want, I'll build three tabernacles. I'll do it myself. And one will be for you. And one will be 
for Moses and one will be for Elijah. Moses representing the law of God and Elijah representing the prophets of God. You see, this thought of a political redeemer was so ingrained in their thinking. But you see, that's not what Jesus was about. Jesus again said, my kingdom is not of this world. So, the teachings of Jesus did give direction on how people should lead others and how people should respond to authority and governmental role. But he was far from being a politician. Aren't you glad? Can I hear an amen? amen. You see, Jesus... If you study his life, he didn't tout any political strategy or philosophy or party because all he was primarily interested in was showing people the love of the Father and advancing the, the spiritual kingdom of God. And the only thing he wanted to be king over while he walked the earth was the hearts of men and women and children, you see. So yes, he spoke out against corruption and depression and evil on all levels. And he provided for us a beautiful blueprint when he taught us the importance of relationships and how we should relate to one another. As a matter of fact, if you want a great blueprint, just look at the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. What an amazing blueprint he gives for us in regard to how we should see life and how we should live life. And so he provided this beautiful blueprint and his teachings did have a significant impact on society and has, a, has had a far-reaching influence in politics for sure, especially here in the United States of America. But guys, that was not his primary focus. It was the kingdom of God that took precedence in his life and his ministry. And the only government he was interested in are the ones who would eventually rest upon his shoulders. Now, back to Romans 13. As we've already established, Paul is speaking specifically of governmental authority. But he's also giving us guidance for all types of authority. And so uh, Romans chapter 13 speaks of the role of authority in the life of the believer. And therefore, we shouldn't just skip over it. The role of authority in the life of the believer, listen, whether it's governmental authority, whether it's parental authority, whether it's spiritual authority, they all have a profound and practical place in our lives as Christians. Now, our response to authority is, is that we can rebel, we can resist, we can revolt, we can revile, or we can remember and recognize and rightly align ourselves and our lives to the word and the will and the ways of God. And that is what Paul is exhorting us to do. Because I think that we all have problems when we hear the A word. When we hear the A word, it, 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 authority. It, 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 it can do something to us. It can push some buttons. It can set some things off in, in our heart and, and, and in our mind or perhaps in, in past experience where, where abuse took place or neglect took place. But Paul is wanting us to know that there is a role for government and authority. And there is a rule of government. And I want to share <laughs> two contrasting thoughts when it comes to the rule of government. 
many, many years ago, there was a Latin phrase that came upon the scene, vox populi, vox dei. And that Latin phrase means the voice of the people is the voice of God. Now, even though some Christians believe this to be true, even in regard to the church's governmental system, this is not a biblically based argument. It is a politically based argument. And we see and we must remember that as Christians, we are first and foremost in a theocracy where God rules and not a democracy where man rules or the voice of the people or the majority rules. In addition, because of the majority of people on earth are godless, we cannot entrust ourselves to a godless society regarding all manners of life. Yes, some manners of life, but not all manners of life. And so it is true, and we are seeing it, that God can use the godless for his plans and for his purposes, but our trust must ultimately lie in God alone. Again, no such thing as a political redeemer. And so you have the, the, the voice of the people is the voice of, of God. It's a political thing. It's not a biblical thing that we should introduce into the church, in my humble opinion. Now, there's another viewpoint. It's the opposite extreme. Please listen. And that is what is called sovereign citizens. Have you guys ever heard of sovereign citizens? No? Floyd, certainly you have. <laughs> Sovereign citizens? Well, I'm glad that you haven't heard of that. Though let me suggest that even if we haven't heard of that phrase, we are somehow some way influenced by that. And sovereign citizens believe that they are not governed by the laws of man. And so they believe in absolute, total self-government. They alone are sovereign. They alone determine what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. And though they would not admit it, it is actually uh, a, a political movement that opposes taxation, questions the legitimacy of government, and basically believes that they are not subject to the flaw laws of mankind. And so what they do is they reject any thought of governmental rule. They resist authority and they reject all authority and they raise their children to do the same. Now, does that sound familiar? Yeah. All right. And we've all been influenced by that thinking to a certain extent. Well, here's the deal. In chapter 13, Paul argues the case of sovereign citizens versus submitted citizens. In verse 1, Paul makes this very clear when he says, Let every person be in subjection to the governmental authorities. All right? Every person doesn't mean some of us or most of us, or if we decide that this is the case. Whether we like it or not, Paul's instruction is let every person be in subjection to governmental authorities. Again, guys, pay your taxes. Now, this word subjection, it carries the idea of order. And it means to place oneself under. Meaning, we should all be under authority because it brings order to society. And Paul actually goes on to say that the role 
role of authority was actually created by God and not by man. And let me just add, if, if Romans chapter 13 doesn't convince you of the need of authority in our lives, just watch an hour of live PD. And that will do the trick. What we discover is that every 2.5 seconds, someone is arrested in the United States of America. Now, that's just the ones who are caught. You can multiply this significantly uh, towards the ones who are not caught for lawlessness, for, for crime, for doing what is wrong within a culture and a society. And so Paul is talking about our relationship to authority. He's talking about the rule or the role of authority. And then in verse 4, he then explains the reason for government or the reason for authority. Again in verse 4, he says, For it, that is authority, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And so... Our response really is very clear because in verse 5 he says, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath but also for conscience sake. And again in verse 1 he said every person, what is our response? Every person should be subject. Every person should be submitted. And Paul, he actually doubles down on this when he says, when we resist delegated authority, we are actually resisting God himself. Wow. Have you ever thought of it? In those terms, have you ever thought of it? When a child rebels against the, his parental authority... What he's ultimately rebelling against, or she is rebelling against, is, is the authority that God has established over them. And so, he tells us what our response is, and in verse 5, Paul tells us that it is necessary to be in subjection. It's, he, he's not saying it is suggested that you be in subjection. You might want to consider being in subjection. That's not how he's phrasing it. He's saying it is absolutely necessary for us as Christians to respect and respond to the authorities that God has placed upon our lives. And the word necessary, it speaks specifically of a religious or spiritual necessity as well as a moral necessity. Now, as I share all these things, this instruction is given with the understanding that the laws of heaven supersede the laws of man. I opened up with that thought. And that whenever possible, we are to submit to the laws of man. But we do see examples in the book of Acts that there are times, there is a place for civil disobedience in the life of the believer. If a government demands that we violate the laws of God because the laws of God transcend and supersede the laws of man. And so if the government demands that we not pray, or we not preach the gospel, or we not evangelize, or, or we not gather together, together in fellowship. We are bound by the laws of God to disobey the laws of man in those instances. And so some laws 
have the potential to be unlawful in the eyes of God in the eyes of the church. Now, an example of this is there is a <clears throat> TV show that's on. I don't watch it, but it is called Purge. And if I am correct, the premise of the show is that every once in a while the government allows its citizens to kill anyone they think is deserving of death. We're going to watch it tonight at Leadership Summit. <laughs> I kid. You don't have to show up, Floyd. We're good. And so the government allows its citizens to kill anyone they think is deserving of death. And so in doing, they are, quote, purging, unquote, society of the undesirables amongst us. But it is actually creating something much different than that. And so for 24 hours or however long it is, it's legal to go on a killing spree. This is what the media is teaching and promoting. But of course, Scripture tells us what? Thou shall not murder. Not kill, murder. Thou shall not murder. And it would actually violate both God's word and Paul says as a Christian it would violate our conscience to commit such a crime against God's creation. You see. And so some laws can be unlawful in the eyes of God. Some laws should be unlawful in the eyes of the church. And we're going to see next week, as we wrap things up this morning, we're going to see next week that there is a royal law that must govern all of our lives, and that is the law of love. I want to say that again. There is a royal law that must govern all of our lives, and that is the law of love. Where next week we're going to see that our lives must be governed by love, our lives must be ruled by love, and how we should allow or should not allow any earthly law to rob us of the greatest law of all, which is to love. It's an important message. I encourage you to be here next week. And Paul is telling us in the first part of Romans chapter 13, listen, that our attitude towards authority both affects and reflects our relationship with God. And that part of being a good citizen of heaven is to also be a good citizen here on earth. Now, before we close, I just want to say this. We are all lawbreakers in this room and those who might be listening over the radio or the internet at another time. We're all lawbreakers in this room. Romans, we saw it earlier, for we have all sinned. We've all broken the laws of God. We've all sinned and fallen short of His glory. Each one of us is a lawbreaker when it comes to our relationship with God. We have all sinned. Now our sins may vary. Some may cross over. But lying, cheating, Stealing, lusting, anger, committing adultery. I mean, we add infinitum, right? The list goes on and on and on and on. And what we need to understand as citizens of heaven is that we have broken God's laws. We have broken God's rule and God's government over our, our lives. 
But we've also broken the laws of man, haven't we? Now, why some places the speed limit is 40 instead of 80, I don't understand. But I would imagine that if a poll was taken, a secret poll, because this is a Baptist church, I just got myself in trouble. <laughs> that most of us would admit that we have spent, right? Some of us may even have articles <laughs> called a ticket <laughs> to prove that point. So maybe we've pilfered from our employer. Maybe we've stolen. Maybe we've done any number of things in man's society and we are all lawbreakers. And I say all that not to condemn us, but to encourage us that there's someone who came upon the scene that solved that problem. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus came and His love overcame the breaking of the law on our parts. And when we come under His covering, His rule, His government, His authority, you see, that is how He sees us from that point on. And He has set us free from the law of sin and death. And He wants to give us that life. He wants to give us that understanding and that perspective that he's covered it. He paid the ticket for us. And we are free in Christ. I'm going to encourage you all to stand. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. and We're going to close in a song of worship. But we're also going to uh, pray this prayer together. Let's pray it out loud. Let it, let's uh, pray together. Let's begin. Father God, we declare that all authority rests in you. And we look forward to the day when all the governments of this world will rest upon the shoulders of Jesus. Help us as citizens of heaven to also be good citizens here on earth. Help us to appreciate the place of delegated authority and how you have intended it for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have prayer uh, need for anything, we want to encourage you to come and to be prayed for. We really do. And if you are a person who has seen yourself perhaps as a sovereign citizen, nobody's going to tell you what to do. You're not the boss of me. Uh, I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, that means you're not subjected to the authority of God in your life. And uh, that is the place, that's the best place for us to be, <laughs> is under His covering, under His rule, under His government. And I want to encourage you, if you have not yet done so, to come forward and, and to tell one of these prayer warriors, you know what, I want to come under the rule of God. I'm tired of being the boss of me. I realize that, that I need something greater than myself. And that something greater is Jesus, who came and he died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And he's coming back again one day to take us all to be with himself, meaning all those who are under his authority. God bless you guys.
Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.